Boom. Cool. All right, so Kurd Hoss. Hoss, Kurd Hoss. Hoss. I know everyone gets three letters and it gets spelled or uh, pronounced the worst ways all the time. I am That's not the worst. That's not the worst. <laughs> so sorry, yeah. man. <laughs> I always joke that um, uh, you're probably a little too young for this, but Johnny Cash had a song called uh, A Boy Named Sue. And the whole story is why did you name his, his son Sue? Well, he was going to prison and he wanted his son to be tough while he was away, so he named him Sue, so he always got to deal with that when he was growing up. So I said, my parents named me Kurt, just to uh, toughen me up, because uh, it's a very different name, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of oh, what man. I do. Yeah. Oh, man. So, man, it's honestly like a, a pleasure, number one, to have you on the podcast, but then also to be a part of the space uh, that, that Zach has, has created for us, and that is so incredible. How are you liking it here so far? Uh, it's awesome here at the foot above, a little plug, no, listen, Zach's a great guy, a little story about uh, how Zach and I met, so I'm in my 50s and uh, I used to own a few supplement stores about 25 years ago and uh, I got a call from a high school and they said, hey, listen, we have a co-op program and we want to know we have a gentleman who's interested in working at their store and learning about supplements and training and stuff and I'm like, yeah, I think it sounds great, send them in and stuff, so uh, he's supposed to come in at a certain date and a certain time and in walks Zach. Now, if you don't know Zach, Zach has always been seven feet tall. And uh, he walks in and he goes, hi, I'm Zach. And I look at him and I go, you will be known as Gigantor. And uh, from that day on, he started off as a co-op student for me. And then he worked for me part time and full time as he was going through school. So full circle, here I am uh, training my clients out of his facility. So it's kind of cool, small world stuff, but connections are real and stuff. So it's really cool to see. But yeah, you know, the uh, was it the uh, pupil master master pupil thing? There you go. There you go. So it's it's been great here. I really like it. It's a great facility. Good people. Great coaches like yourself. Great vibe. Uh, and to me, the environment is super super important. Not just for uh, you and me and other coaches, but for the clients that are around all of us. Right. right? It's it's a really great atmosphere. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's an important a community and having people that uh, support each other and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we're a little bit competitive at times, but it's 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 healthy competition. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know what? It, it brings up everyone's game. You know, uh, I've been in the gym business one way or the other for 30 years, and uh, I see all kinds of garbage when I go to the gyms. I'm a member of three or four gyms now, and, and I watch, I watch the trainers, and and I hate being called a trainer. I, I prefer being called a coach. There's more to it than just being a trainer and stuff. Uh, but we all start somewhere. Right. But the the integrity and, and the way in which I find the coaches here carry themselves is very, very good. And it makes a big difference uh, for the clients, especially, but also for the atmosphere and the rest of us, right? If you, the circle of five, where you spend your most time and who you spend your time with raises your game and you become the average of those people. And it's very much the case here. Right, yeah. that is awesome, man. Um, now that I'm starting to get to know you and, and things like that, see you around the gym, seeing that you're bench pressing over five plates, like what, what in the world is that? So my first question is, Tell me about your personal fitness journey. I know you, you said that you've been around the block, and yeah. so I, I'm sure that's an interesting story as far as how many years you've been training and how you got to where it is that you are in terms of strength. So I'm so curious about that. It's pretty cool. Listen, I started training before the internet, before the interwebs. Uh, I'm 55 years old. I uh, grew up on the farm, and I was a big kid, 6'2", 220, 230, and I showed up at college, and uh, I realized that uh, I want to get in better shape, and quite honestly, I want to get in better shape for the ladies, right? I mean, I, I you know, I was at that age, and I'm like, you know, I got to get in better shape. I was a little pudgy and stuff. I was a big dude. Um, I was strong, cause I, a farm strong, farm boy strong. So I joined the gym, and I remember uh, training and working out, and I loved it from day one. I, I knew this is exactly where I should be. Um, you know, I could deadlift three plates pretty quick out of the gate. I could squat over three fit, three plates pretty quick out of the gate because. Working hard on the farm, <clears throat> you're lifting and carrying things all the time. But when it came to the bench press, there's nothing really that mimics that in day-to-day -day activity. So I remember struggling with like 75 pounds and 90 pounds on the bench. And I'll never forget this. I was training one day and this little little French bodybuilder comes in and lays down beside me. And I mean, you know, great shape. I mean, right off the gate, you could tell he was, an, he was a good lifter, a uh, bodybuilder. And he's benching three plates for reps. He finishes it, racks it, and he literally goes outside to have a smoke. And I remember sitting there going, just happened. So my experience was, if you're big, you're strong. That's an automatic, right? So, you know, showed how ignorant I was to the process, but it really, really made me mad. And uh, I just said, that's it. I'm just gonna become a better bencher. And I didn't love benching when I started. I was angry. I was pissed that it just wasn't where the others were, right? So talk about the competitiveness and stuff. And uh, I just focused on it. And I tried everything. I did everything. And I trained my 
literally train my ass off until the bench became what I was known for. I, I, at the time, even in the first 10 years, I was a better squatter and deadlifter for the amount of work I was putting in, but I didn't have the passion for it. The bench, I could bench five days a week. I could bench at two in the morning. I didn't care. I loved it at that point. And uh, yeah, and you know what? Again, pre-internet, we relied on all the muscle mags that came out and stuff, right? So, you know, muscle and fitness and muscle mag. And yeah, because I was like just that. about to say, I was about to say, man, this is pre 96, right? Yeah. This is pre-internet. <laughs> so information was so scarce and it literally was, some guys had the secrets, right? Uh, I was in college in pure and applied science, physics, chemistry, and math. I'm a pretty smart guy. So I understood force and vectors and things like that. But how to apply it to a sport was, was something that I had to learn. So I remember, you know, you'd buy a bodybuilding magazine, 200 some odd pages, and maybe there'd be a page and a half in powerlifting with two pictures. You know, that start position, mid position, finish position. Well, you know, as a coach, there's a lot of things that happen in between those positions and stuff. And I would memorize those pages. And I just, you know, just assimilated and assimilated and assimilated. And whatever I could learn, I applied. And, you know, by the time uh, 96 rolled around, uh, I was benching drug free, uh, 500. I, was, I started my first competition in 96 and I went in and just ate it all up and did very well and I uh, got drug tested all the time because I was lifting numbers that uh, they didn't think were possible at the time and uh, just that's been part of my thing ever since. And you know when you fall in love with something you become passionate about it, people that are looking for that get drawn to you. So right out of the gate people would always ask me about uh, training and helping them. And I wasn't even in the fitness business, literally in the first part. I was just a meathead going to the gym. I had four or five memberships and I would do legs here and back there and chest there and stuff. And you know, the funny part is I did all this because I wanted to get leaner and better shape for the girls. And, and really what happened is my confidence grew and my, my, my just internal strength grew. And that's really what led to those things happening is just the confidence. That right. Kind of thing. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's awesome. I mean, like, I think most of us can relate to the idea of going into the gym, especially us men when we were younger, we're like, man, I'm gonna go to the gym, get this like six pack. Six weeks from now, I'm gonna be <laughs> jacked and, and you know. And <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be able to get as many yeah. uh, girls attracted to me as possible. Exactly, right? exactly. And then it turns into something that becomes a part of who we are. Exactly. Which is really cool. So what came first then, the chicken or the egg? Because I know that you run a powerlifting meet. Um, but you're also a coach, <coughs> personal trainer. <laughs> <laughs> so which came first and how did that, how did you end up transitioning to it? So over the years, uh, I was always entrepreneurial. So uh, one day, uh, a buddy of mine knew I wanted to open up a gym because at the time in the uh, early 90s, gyms were failing all the time. They were closing all the time. And uh, I, I said one day, I was working with a guy in a cleaning supply company at the time, and I go, oh, this is bullshit. Someday I'm gonna start my own gym. You know, because I just tired of like, I think two of my memberships went down that week. And uh, next week he followed, calls me up, he goes, hey, he goes, uh, I got something. I go, what? He goes, there's a hotel in Rockland that has a gym and they're willing to rent it out. They don't want to run it anymore. You would be interested in jumping in with me on this. And I'm like, oh, fuck, let's go take a look. So we drove out to Rockland. I didn't even know where Rockland was, east of Ottawa, you know. And uh, sure enough, there was like a Best Western hotel and in the basement was two squash courts and a small gym, maybe 1,500 square feet. And uh, went upstairs, talked to the manager, put a deal together and boom, I was in the gym business. And that's, that's literally how it started. And just started training people and, and just working out and you know, grew from there. And over the 30 years, I've had three or four different gyms. I've had supplement stores. I've always been in this field of fitness and nutrition and stuff uh, because I love it. Um, but that in itself has been its own crazy journey as well and stuff. So, but that's literally how it just started. And then, uh, like you said, if you do something and you're passionate about something, things will be attracted to you, right? So that's literally how it came. Hey, train me, hey, train me, you go to gym, let's go. And that's how it was. Oh, that is awesome, man. So how did then, so I guess you, you started coaching clients at that point because you were, you had your own gym. Yeah. So people would ask me and you know, back then, uh, coaching was personal training coaching was very new. You know, I remember it was a hustle to get $15 an hour, right. you know, that kind of stuff, uh, you know, or in the nineties. Right. Um, and, and it was something that only the affluent could have and, and that kind of thing. And it, you know, I mean, protein was a four letter word. It, it was so much in those, in those years that we really were like trailblazers back then and stuff. And, uh, I, I, I just kind of just went where things took me. And that's kind of, I think what's been good for me, but also bad for me is I kind of go with the flow and stuff. Right. And, uh, there are times when uh, I wouldn't even train people. I'd be so busy working on the business or, you know, I got caught up in growth. I want to open another store. I want to do this. I want to do that. So I focused on the things that I was really good at 
uh, but I didn't focus enough on the things that I needed to work on as well. So there was a lot of ups and downs in businesses over time like that. And the one thing I learned is that anytime I drifted away from my own training, um, my life went sideways. And then, you know, when I would, you know, basically pick myself up and, and kind of restart, I'm like on my third restart, um, you know, it, it always led back to get in the gym, start working out, start feeling better, and then things will come to you and stuff. And, and that's really how I just attracted more clients. This last rendition of me, 55 years old, uh, this year, as we talked, uh, 285, 290 pounds. Uh, when I started three years ago in a rebuild, I was 398 pounds. Very big power lifter. I could bench almost 600 pounds. So I'm like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a power lifter. But I was a fat power lifter. I was broken. I had a lot of things I was dealing with. Right. And uh, when COVID hit, uh, on a lot of levels, COVID was terrible. But I think it's probably one of the best things that happened to me on some levels because uh, I closed the gym just before that that I had that wasn't going well. I was overwhelmed. I had too many things happening. I was 390 pounds, the worst shape of my life. And 18-hour uh, day work days, the stress was never. I was running meets. I was doing this. I had four or five really good things going, but I had four or five good things going at the same time, which doesn't work. Um, and uh, as I focused on one, the other ones would weekend and stuff. So one day I just said, that's it. I've had enough. And I literally pulled the plug. And uh, at that point, uh, I came back home and COVID literally hits two or three months later. And uh, I was at home and I'm like, all right, can't go to the gyms. Uh, I got nothing to do. I'd never been home this much in my life, right? That kind of thing. So I said, well, I had some equipment in my garage and I said, well, I'm gonna start doing a few workouts, had a couple of training partners. And I literally just started working out and I said, you know what, I'm gonna get in shape. This is the time, this is the gift I have. I've got all this space and time. I'm going to put it to good use and if I don't I'm going to go even crazier and uh, I just started losing weight and all I started doing was posting my results on Facebook. I've always loved social media. I love the interaction, the attention, the focus and the connection and stuff and literally I would get up every morning, I would weigh in and I would stand in front of a mirror in my garage and in my underwear and take a picture and just post this is where I'm at today. Every day, every day, every day. One day uh, I would get comments and you know was, you know, people direct messaging me and stuff. And one day, one of my good friends messaged me, says, Curry, what are you training? I said, well, I'm training in my garage. You know, it's, 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 you know, we're breaking the law. We have to be undercover here, you know? He goes, would you train me? And I go, well, I train out of my garage. And if we did it, it would have to be very quiet, that kind of thing. You know, he goes, yeah, yeah. And he goes, well, how much would you charge me? And at that point, I had no, I wasn't thinking of personal training people. I wasn't thinking of coaching. I was really trying to fix myself. So I, I threw a number out there. I said, this much for 10 sessions. He goes, all you transfer now. I'm like, oh, all right. So that happened. And then we started training three times a week in my garage. No heat. And it was just hardcore, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he loved it, right? So he kept doing it. Another person reached out. Another person reached out. It got to the point, David, where uh, I have a two-car garage, crammed with equipment. It, in, in the colder months, we had a propane torch going in the corner. If it was cold enough, we wore gloves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was busy. I was training five sessions a day, oh, wow. you know, that kind of thing, charging. And every time, you know, I would sit there and get a little more calm, I'm gonna charge a little more. What are other people charging? What's going on stuff like that? So I really started to really focus on what my worth is, what my value is. And uh, I just did it and I did it. And you know what? At one point I sat back and at this point I'd lost about 80 pounds. So I was feeling fantastic. Um, I looked at my bank account. I had more money in my bank account than I'd ever had in my life. Uh, it wasn't millions or anything like that, but I mean, I had been struggling for the last two, three years to really hold everything together. And uh, I'm like, the universe has been telling me this for 20 years. Right. Train, coach people. Mm -hmm. This is what you're good at. And this is what bring the value to the world is what you help people with. And it's your journey that they're inspired by. And that created where I'm at today. That's, that's amazing, man. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so like training out of your garage, uh, now you got a couple of clients, you have a very successful business. How does that then translate into um, uh, now you know, hosting powerlifting meets, that's... So all along the way, over the last 10 years, I've run powerlifting meets. I love powerlifting. I competed the first time in 1996, and uh, I should have competed in 1990. I was strong enough, but classic male ego. I'm not strong enough. When I'm a little stronger, I'll compete. When I'm a little stronger, and what I was really saying is I'm too afraid to put it out in the line. I'm afraid I'm not going to win. I'm afraid all these things, but I was, you know, obviously doing the mental gymnastics with it. And uh, one day I said, uh, I'm trying not to swear. I don't know. So one day I said, fuck, fuck this. Fuck. <laughs> and as you hear me in here training people, I swear a lot. So I'm like, fuck this. I signed up. And listen, back in the 90s, you, you, to compete, you either had to go to Toronto or Quebec City or right. the States. There wasn't a lot of competitions going around. So I went in there 
and uh, I was competing in the bench. And I mean, I'd never competed before. I knew of it, I wasn't stupid, but I'd never done it. So I remember they had an equipment check-in and I walk up and he goes, your name? I give him my name and he goes, uh, what do you, what's, you know, we need to check in your equipment. So what are you wearing? I go, well, I have a singlet because you're supposed to wear a singlet in a sexy unitard. And he goes, do you have a belt? I go, no, I don't wear a belt. He goes, uh, do you have wrist straps? I go, no, I don't wear wrist straps. He goes, uh, what shoes are you wearing? So I lift my foot up and I'm like, there's my shoe. Okay. So, and he also, I can tell the guy, he's like, who's this fucking guy, right? He's riding away. So then he goes, uh, what's your opener on the bench? The bench I go, uh, pounds or kilos? He goes, kilos. I'm like, oh shit. I go, uh, it's 455 in, uh, in kilos. He literally stops riding. He looks up at me for the first time. He goes, what? I go, yeah, 450, 455. So he's like, what's well, this many kilos? I'm like, oh, okay, I'll open with that. And he fucking looks at me like I'm just this guy who came out of the fucking mountains. I'm wearing like a plain <laughs> white t-shirt. I don't know, you know? And uh, so I'm like, oh, all right. So we're in this big gym in Toronto called Monster Gym. It's Fitness 365, just on Martin Road in Dixie now. Um, and it's a big gym and we're warming up. And I, again, I have a buddy with me who's been training with me for years. So we knew we were very good friends. And uh, I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, if I warm up this way, this is what I normally do. And we're all standing around and I know there's rules, right? So I'm like, uh, at one point, I, I'm that guy that if I, if I meet someone in a new situation, that's my go-to guy until I, you know, that kind of stuff. So he comes out and I go, hey man, I go, uh, can I use the washroom? And he looks at me, like, again, he's like, who is this guy? I go, yeah, he goes, yeah, of course, you just go over there. I said, oh, okay, I didn't know how to stay the same way. He goes, no, 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 so I go in the bathroom, I come out. And uh, so I'm with my buddy and stuff, and I said, well, I guess I better start warming up. I think we're starting in about 35 minutes. So everyone's on the benches warming up, and uh, I warm up one plate, two plate, three plates. I throw on, uh, and I'm trying to figure this out. So uh, I go to my buddy, I said, let's do four plates, I'll do a set of five. And uh, so I get on, I hammer it out. Now the adrenaline's going, I'm excited, I'm nervous. So I destroy four plates for five, like it was a rocket. So I get up and I'm like, oh, I felt pretty good. And my buddy leans over, he goes, everybody stopped. <laughs> we watched you do that set. Oh. And I'm like, what? I said, everybody. I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, did I do something wrong? He goes, I don't know. So we go, the competition happens. I open with 455 with pause, I nail it. I go 470, I pause, I nail it. I go 485, I struggle, but I get it. They went from, who is this fucking guy from the mountains to who is this fucking guy? I want to talk to him, right? So it was really, really cool. And I remember walking off that platform and all I could think of, I should have fucking done this 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. So that always stuck with me, just training and competing. And I would train and compete two or three times a year and stuff. And um, I always would tell people, the moment I saw they had an interest in lifting, even before I ran competition, I was like, guys, sign up, let's go, let's get a meet going, you know, sign up to a meet, because I knew that would change things. The moment you sign up, there's a line in the sand, you commit, you commit to more workouts, better workouts, you know, that kind of thing. For you guys and myself as coaches, when your client commits to the next level, it, they bring more to the table, we have more to work with, right, that kind of stuff, because listen, at the end of the day, yeah, we're paid to do this. But really, we benefit the most when we see our clients do well. That's the altruistic uh, value that we bring. And, and I, 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 I'm speaking for myself, and I'm sure it's the same for you, is that you know, we pride ourselves in what we bring to our clients. And when they do well, we do well. We share in that with them. Right? It, it's very, very, um, it's emotional sometimes. It's very powerful, right? You know? And um, so I, I was always doing that. And then one day, a new federation, and I was competing in this federation, it was drug tested, I got drug tested all the time, I had no problem with it, I was lifetime drug free at the time, and uh, back then if you set a record, you only got it if you took a drug test, so I'm like, test me, and I had to pay for it, it didn't matter. And then along the way, other federations started popping up uh, that were just a little bit different, a little outlawish, only because they were just bucking the trend. So imagine you've got the major leagues, or the NHL, right? And everyone, that's it's the NHL, it's the best league in the world. Well, there's other leagues but everyone compares themselves to that main league and stuff. And it doesn't mean those other leagues aren't good, it's just they're not as big. So in the powerlifting world, it was the same thing. So one day I went to, and the one thing I found about the, the Fed I used to compete in is they were very stuffy and there was a lot of clicks and stuff. And I'm not into that. Uh, uh, you know, I'm big on be you, be who you are and stuff. So I, as soon as I, there's a click or there's a, you know, uh, a, a bit of a bullying thing, I, I, I stiffen up against that kind of stuff, right? So. There's this other federation that was competing in Montreal and I knew a guy who was doing it and I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm gonna go do this one. Well, dude, we go in there, it's bench only, 
for me, you know, there's lifts and stuff, but as soon as you walk in, the fucking metal, heavy metal music's playing, the energy's different and stuff like that. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. there's judges and everything, like it's all run the same, it's all legit, but it was just different. They had an amateur division and they had a pro division. So basically amateur meant you were subject to drug testing. Pro division meant you were not gonna get drug tested, do whatever the fuck you want, right? Right off the bat, I love that because I still was amateur at the time. But at the end of the day, I also believe in live your life, be who you are. I don't like people pretending, I don't like cheating. So if you're, you know, you're competing in amateur and you're really a pro, that's bullshit, right? I don't stand for that. But if you're pro, fucking be pro, be yourself. So I like that. It was just a different atmosphere. And uh, competed, had a great time. The atmosphere was a lot of fun. At the end of it, there was a barbecue, everyone's drinking beer. I'm like, it's like a motorcycle fucking rally for powerlifting. And I'm like, I'm home. You know, I've been missing this and stuff. And then I started talking to one of the guys that was running it and he was telling me about it. And he goes, ah, you know what? You should look at running a meet in Ottawa. And I'm like, I should run a fucking meet in Ottawa. And that's how I started. I started running meets, uh, got a few pieces of the equipment, borrowed some of the competition equipment. And then just, again, the business part of me took over. And I'm like, you know, if we do this well, we can make a business out of this, but we can also provide a great atmosphere and a great service and stuff. And uh, so I've been doing that off and off now for 15 years. COVID kind of kicked us in the balls a bit with that, but we still managed to run some meets inside of like, car garages and like you know uh, body shops and hardcore shit trucks on hoist and stuff you know <laughs> wow. so if we had literally if there was a month where you know restrictions were open enough we had to meet right. you know so to me that was important because it kept the powerlifting community having something to do and i felt on the mental health point of view especially with covid and the shutdowns we needed a reason to train we needed a reason to get up in the morning and stuff like that and to me that's what again what i liked about the powerlifting is that it gave people purpose for the training. They showed up for their sessions. They showed up on time. They worked hard because in X amount of weeks, they were getting on the platform. Yeah. And to this day, when anyone, I see anyone interested in powerlifting, I tell them, listen, I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't think you were ready for it. It's you against you, right? And so if I see you're, you're like deadlifting or like benching or like squatting, we can compete in any of those. And uh, when I see the person has that pension for it or they like it, I want to take that to the next level for them. And I tell them the same story. When you do it, you're going to walk off the platform. You're going to find me and tell me I was right. You should have done this a year ago or five years ago because it is an amazing experience. That's awesome, man. Because like, a lot of things that are, as you're talking, the first thing that's coming to my mind is, is finding community. Yeah. Uh, finding purpose within community. Yeah. Right? And so, like, I think that's so important because a lot of people, especially after COVID, started to feel like they were ostracized, right? Isolated, ostracized, alone, yeah. right? That kind of stuff. And if you want to talk about going into a mental spiral, right. start feeling alone, mm -hmm. right? It's, 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 it, I think it's the single worst thing that came out of COVID. Whatever you want to believe as far as what it was or what it wasn't, we're not going to get into that today. Right. But I think the single worst uh, devastation uh, of it, the, the, the calamity from it is the isolation right. and what that's caused, right? And the mental health in the abuse, uh, in, in, increased abuse of drugs and alcohol and, and just demons, you know, that we all fight with just, you gave too much room for these things and stuff, you know, and we were told, Hey, don't, don't, don't hang out together. It's not safe, but the liquor stores are open. Don't hang out. It's not safe. Don't go here and do this, but you know, you can go buy your bakery goods. You can, you know, there was a thing, uh, in Westboro, I was doing a lot of walking at the time. And I, I saw this really crazy physical manifestation of what was crazy about the COVID situation as I was walking down a block in Westboro and there was a store that was a pierogi store, the lineup of people going in to get pierogies. There was a bakery store right beside it, the lineup of people to go into it. There was a wine rack store, the lineup of people to go into it. And the last building on the corner was a personal training studio that was boarded up. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a visual representation of how fucking backwards right. we were handling this. Because the very first thing they said, and I said I wouldn't go into this, but the very first thing they said we can do to deal with COVID was work on our health. What's the very first thing we shut down? Gyms and training, right? So basically we made it so it was impossible for people to get healthy, right? right? We, we couldn't train in the gym, but we could stand at Walmart or Costco, you know, six feet apart. It's ridiculous, right? So to me, that is the single most dangerous thing that came out of this is that we got weaker physically, we got weaker mentally, and then we had all the stresses that came along with it and stuff. Didn't matter what side you were on, it was stressful, right? So to me, the biggest thing is, no matter what we're going through, we need to work on our health. Right. We need to work on our physical health and our mental health. And to me, it all starts in the gym. Gonna restart this. Okay. Uh, and then we're almost done. <laughs>